How's it going? So I'm just going to kind of get straight into this. Um, I'm here to talk to you guys about tissue culture and what it is, how you go about it, and just kind of explain how I got into this whole industry. It's kind of interesting. So to begin, um, tissue culture started about a, hundred, a little over a hundred years ago, and it has revolutionized industries, the bamboo industry, the banana industry, the pineapple industry. Back in the day, you could only take a cutting and get it to root and propagate via that method. And this um, in vitro culture or growing in non-biological conditions or not normal biological conditions, you can actually create an environment where the plant wants to replicate without the need to take all that time um, of creating a new meristem from each plant. So what are the uses of tissue culture in cannabis? This is where this is a question everybody asks me. And apart from the things on this list, um, I just want to kind of touch on what it actually does. Um, you can actually get about 20% faster growth or reset the genetics to almost seed rates by putting plant through tissue culture. Um, that's not every cultivar, and a lot of it is protocol dependent. So I can't talk for every industry or every um, cultivar of cannabis. But specific ones, I have seen um, the growth rates exponentially increase by just basically resetting those cuts that are cuts and cuts that have been going on for about 19, 20 years, um, which is huge for this industry. So why do we use tissue culture over cuttings or traditional cloning methods, those sort of things? Um, I guess the biggest one is tissue culture doesn't require maintenance once it's in the tube. You let it sit there and it grows. Um, that means you don't have to water it, you don't have to look at it every day, it just sits there. Um, I've had these cultures stay alive for up to nine months at a time without having to touch them whatsoever under just normal room temperature conditions. And a lot of them will die off by that point, but at the same time, it's good to know that you can keep them in tubes. Um, it's what the USDA actually uses to hold on to endangered species or other um, plantlets that they're having a hard time propagating. I actually started doing quite a bit of this at the Denver Botanic Gardens where I ran their protocol creation lab, and I realized, well, I was doing that, my passion um, lie with cannabis, and nobody in the industry really knew what it was or was talking about it. So that's when I started my company, Minibus, and I've just been going around doing tissue culture consulting and small-scale lab setup. And I can't stress enough, small-scale lab setup. Um, one of the questions I commonly get asked doing consulting is, what's this media made out of? And really it's just all the uh, nutrients, vitamins, and hormones the plant needs in order to grow. Uh, sometimes you can incorporate antibiotics to prevent pathogens from um, either establishing or coming out into the media, or you can add dyes to try and color code some of your stuff. Um, it's all about growing with an input of sugar instead of letting the plant photosynthesize, the plant grows off the sugar that's located in the media, along with all the nutrients, vitamins, and hormones it would normally need to grow. So how do you know what chemical concentrations of all these things to add? Well, apart from lots of different nutrient companies that have developed this stuff, um, there is a media called MS Media. It is the standard for every tissue culture protocol, pretty much, that I've seen. Um, there's a couple modifications for bananas or orchids or things like that. But in general, this MS Media was um, developed for tobacco culture. And that is key to talk about here because Cannabis is not tobacco. So when you put it in this media, sometimes these uh, plants are lacking nitrogen or you're lacking other hormones that you'd expect, and they're just not there. And that requires each individual cultivar to have a specific protocol made for it. Um, I can't stress that enough because in every other aspect of the horticulture industry, you'll see uh, Scutellaria bicolensis and Scutellaria orientalis, or different species such as, that require different hormone nutrient blends. But most people, when we talk about cannabis tissue culture, they want to do a one-shoe-fits-all to it and hope that it works out with just one protocol. And I've seen that too many times where that's not the case. You'll develop a protocol, it works with one species, not another. Um, so you need to understand the morphology of your plant, I guess, is where the main concept of all this comes in. A lot of people define it as sativa indica, and 
I realized um, quite a while ago those terms were invented in the 1700s, the late 1700s, but all the same. So I've grown plants that have a more indica-leaning leaf structure and a more sativa-leaning leaf structure that have the same basic effect and require completely different nutrients. And when I say effect, I'm talking about the hobby. Um, the other thing that I did was I tried a couple different hormone blends that were unconventional, and as you can see in some of these pictures here, they'll produce elongated leaves or just weird genetic issues that are all um, environmental based. So it's epigenetic stress changes rather than actual gene um, changes themselves. Once you culture that plant again and again, it will revert back to the state that it normally was at. There are four common stages to tissue culture, and I'm just going to summarize these because they're in all the literature, essentially. Um, you have your stage one initiation. It takes about two to four weeks, or two weeks for almost every one of these stages. Your stage two, which is your multiplication, you're trying to mass your cells. Stage three, you get the plant to root once the stems have grown and your cells have massed. And then stage four, your acclimation stage, where you go and you harden it off. Um, that rooting stage I need to talk about really quickly, and I'll get into this as well. It's very hard to establish a set rooting protocol for every single cultivar of cannabis. Um, I've read some literature talking about hops and people trying to do indirect cell organogenesis, where it only works some of the time on some cultivars, but not all. And so you run into a lot of problems going down that path. Um, I have found that if you germinate seeds, or quote unquote, a well-designed protocol, so straight MS media, takes about eight days to root and shoot at the same time. Uh, that can exponentially cut down on your propagation time, but if you do it for cuttings, you have to develop that individual protocol for that individual species of plant, and that is something most people just don't have. So, right now, um, I want to get into stage one, that initiation stage, because this is where the magic um, basically happens, why everybody wants to advertise tissue culture to you. And it's all about just cleaning the exterior tissue of your plant. I'm not talking about endophyte removing or anything else. All I'm talking about is taking something like tween 20, which is a non-ionic detergent, and adding it with some bleach to some reverse osmosis water, so there's no minerals in there, mixing it up for about 10 minutes, and then um, transferring everything under your laminar flow hood in order to maintain a sterile environment. That's about it, but the key there is maintaining clean tissue from the start. So you got to talk about two different forms of stage one tissue culture, at least in cannabis. There's actually a third that's called callus culture. I'm not even going to go into that because as far as I'm aware, very few, if anybody, has developed a protocol where you can get shoots or indirect organogenesis, so shoots to form from callus culture. We're going to go on to meristem culture, which is taking a meristem. You can see, uh, let's see here, highlighted in that um, red bubble here, you can see a meristem. There's lateral meristems and apical meristems. If you take an apical meristem, that tissue can be so new, you can actually culture out of viruses. Yes, you can culture out of viruses. That does not guarantee the virus is going to be eliminated because there's a good chance you had human error and you did not culture out of that virus. So that being said, you need to really look at does your plant have virus in the first place? If it doesn't, I would recommend auxiliary node culture. It's a hell of a lot easier to do. So with auxiliary node culture, all you do is you take a cutting where those uh, red lines are, and you can just stick it straight in your media after cleaning the exterior tissue. Generally, this works out. So that second picture in there, you can actually see shoots starting to form out of the plant, and that's actually two plants out of one. That took about a week, to get to that stage, another week of growth, and it would have been good enough to cut off of, making it so you can exponentially multiply your cuttings. At this point in time, you can see um, the infected uh, pathogen, or the plant that was infected by a pathogen in there, and those pathogens uh, can create huge issues. I've heard quite a few presenters here talk about endophytes, and that's exactly what the majority of them are. You have endophytes or bacteria living inside your cell wall that pop out into your media about two weeks after you've cultured. That's a huge problem. Um, you don't know they're there, and I've heard too many growers tell me, well, my plants are completely clean and I know exactly what's in them. You go to culture their, their crop and it's just 
you'd be amazed what you see out of there. I actually have some pictures coming up of some of those things. So the stage two is the multiplication stage. I was typically getting a one to three to one to eight division ratio per culture every single time I did this. And that culture media only cost a couple cents a piece, so it's virtually free to do once you set up the lab. Now, you only want to keep a plant in stage two, um, or I guess in culture, for no more than five generations at a time. If you do more than that, you start to get genetic degradation the same way that holding onto a 20-year-old cutting would have. So, just not a good idea. Stage two, the multiplication stage, has quite a few advantages over just typical cuttings as well. You can create bushy, clumpy plants. That picture in the center I actually managed to get 22 cuttings off of that single 25 millimeter culture. That was huge because all of a sudden I could exponentially um, manipulate that plant and get a ton of cuttings out of the single uh, plant mass. This also poses another question. What else does it do? It cuts down on your actual vegetative growth time. So when you already have the structure you're looking for, where you don't have to do that initial peach tree pruning, um, where you get that nice bushy top canopy that's all evenly consistent, and you start off with a plant that already has that structure, you can grow your plants a little bit shorter, but they're still going to yield the same amount as if you topped them and topped them and topped them to try and get that yield that you were looking for by growing them out an extra month. The, the third stage here is the rooting stage, and this is one of the big stages that I'm going to touch on here in a little bit as well, but it just depends on your hormone blend, um, the temperature fluctuations of your culture, and some of the contamination that might happen with some of these uh, cultures. Sometimes you'll have weird contaminants or endophytes that don't want to come out in the media, and once you start rooting, you'll actually see some of the roots degrade because they have endophytes that only like living in the root system. I mean, it makes sense. Plants are like icebergs. They have more mass on the bottom a good majority of the time. So one of the keys I want to stress here is stage three has the potential to ship plants in the dark. Um, I did a small scale trial on this where I did no more than 24 plants and I rooted them in the dark. That first picture is how I got the idea. I had cut a plant down, this is cannabis, and I had stuck it in a 55 gallon trash bag and forgotten about it for a little over a week. Um, week later I just wanted to check, see if it had started molding or whatnot, open it up and there were roots all over the um, lower part of the plant, right where the callus or the undifferentiated cells really would have appeared. You can start to see those white little dots. Those are all root starts. And so I gave it a shot in tissue culture. Why not try it in vitro if it works ex vitro? And the results I got were varied. Um, every plant rooted, yes, but if you look at that picture, the top of the plant didn't always look completely healthy. And that could be due to a lot of different things. Chances are it wasn't developing some sort of hormone and you need to develop a protocol for that particular cultivar that would fix that issue. In my case, I was just seeing binary A or B. Do they root or not? And turns out they do, which was huge for a lot of the uh, future potential in this industry. Now, I also want to advertise uh, the roots are not going all straight down. Some go completely straight out, and I don't know what causes that. I didn't look enough into it. Just throwing that out as food for thought. Not necessarily perfect root systems. Stage four, the acclimation stage. This is one that a lot of people are struggling with, so I'll touch base on it really quick and get back into it later. Stage four, you're just getting plants into the greenhouse. That's about it. So once they're there, they develop a nice healthy root system, and as long as you don't add more inoculants and create uh, issues within the plant itself, they tend to remain fairly healthy. Now, at times, um, if you look at the bottom right picture here, you'll actually see some of the plant tissue is deformed, or the morphology of it was not correct. That means my initial hormone blend when I was culturing that plant was not what it should have actually been. You'll see different serration issues and things like that, and within about two weeks of pulling it out of the tube, it'll revert back to its normal state. You won't even know it was there, but it is good to mention that those type of things can happen coming out of in vitro culture. 
Um, the hardening stage is fairly simple, but I've seen a lot of people struggle with it, and it's just a matter of removing the humidity over the course of a week. So what you see here is just a soup food container, nothing insane, um, where I just shoved a Grodin Rockwell cube uh, with a plant inside of it, and slowly over the course of about a week, I let it harden off, and it worked great. Now, I should mention, um, as I was pulling some of these plants out of culture, the roots would snap off if I accidentally touched them or I brushed them against something. So they are extremely fragile at this state. They've been growing in basically a jello substance the entire time. At that point, you know, you can pull it out, you can wiggle it around, they might not break off, but you go flicking those or tapping them, there's a good chance the plants are not accustomed to that. They haven't developed the, um, re or the resistance in the uh, structure to really be able to move around that much. They were never agitated in the beginning. There was no wind in the tube. Don't expect there to be wind the second you take them out. Um, so the four main problems with tissue culture, and this is the biggest uh, stress I have here, is improper hormone creations. Uh, endophytes, the rooting stage, and the acclimation stage. So the endophyte, or I'm um, sorry, the improper hormones. Every time I have looked and read a research article online about cannabis tissue culture, I see TDZ as the main ingredient. So we got to talk about TDZ here. It's actually an herbicide that is a plant growth regulator, and it causes the uh, leaves to lose weight, but not fall off. So as you can see in some of these pictures, this was the, uh, some of the first tissue culture I had done, just trialing some of these protocols. The leaves are on there, they're a lot smaller, they're yellowing, and they don't look healthy. I do not recommend using TDZ as a starting point or any other point for cannabis tissue culture. That's just a huge no-no in my book, and I've never found one plant species that works with that cannabis-wise. Um, so using better oxen-cytokinin combinations is a much better idea. Um, metatoplin is the one I would recommend people start with. If you use metatoplin, you get a pretty good growth, but it doesn't always uh, root or it can have other issues. It's just a good starting point. I also included a lot of other cytokinins in this slide, so if anybody wants to experiment, try some of those out, your chance of success will go up. You also need to know that auxins in coordination or in ratio with those cytokinins make a huge difference. Endophytes are the second point here. Endophytes, I drew a nice little pretty picture, uh, live inside the cell walls as indicated by the blue lines, and you'll actually see them pop out in the media about two weeks after you culture the plant. Um, this is so problematic I can't even explain how many times I've heard people fail at tissue culture and stop their lab because they literally don't know what happened. So here's the problem. Endophytes can be toxic or novel, um, so beneficial. Those inoculants that we've all talked about adding to our plants that are very beneficial might not culture all so well. That's just a consideration. It doesn't mean don't use them or anything like that. Just be aware of what you're actually adding to your plant and if it's likely to pop out in media if you're trying to get somebody to tissue culture your plant or you're tissue culturing yourself. So here's a couple more pathogen pictures because I just couldn't believe I had over 20, and I tried to fit as many as I could in just a single slide to show you they're all over the spectrum, and rather than going through and trying to identify all these, I decided it would be a wiser use of my time to figure out how to get rid of them. So what I did was I noticed we were using inoculants that had endophytic properties, um, such as the bacillus. What I ended up doing was, to get rid of them, I watered with hydrogen peroxide at about a 3 to 5% concentration every day while adding in my nutrients to my water. Over the course of about three weeks, I actually was able to recover some of these plants to the point where the pathogen slowed down, or the endophytes slowed down inside the plant tissue itself, and you were able to get a couple clean um, in vitro cultures. And that was huge. Maybe not all of them, but some of them would take. So if you look at um, common stage three rooting problems, one of the biggest ones I ran into at first was I was using uh, T5 lights, those small little uh, bulbs, essentially. And it, my temperature fluctuations would change more than 10 degrees, sometimes up to 20 degrees between day and nighttime temperatures. 
I realized very quickly that was one of the biggest limiting factors and switched to complete LED lights for my uh, tissue culture. It almost overnight fixed my problem, all of them, which I couldn't believe just the temperature fluctuation alone. Potentially some of the light uh, created some of that. And so what I try to tell people uh, when they're trying to create some of these hormone blends or whatnot is look at the compounds or the bottles that you've used as rooting hormones for the rest of your cannabis grow. I mean, people have been doing this for years. Why not pay attention to the IBA concentrations on the back of Clonex or Hortus or Hormex? If you start looking at those and you actually utilize those ratios and some of the additives they're putting in, you're going to be a lot more successful at rooting your culture in vitro. I do also need to mention the previous media plays a big impact or has a big role in your actual natural successive stage. If you have too much cytokinin buildup from stage two or multiplication media, your stage three media will have residual and you're going to form more callus than you will roots. Ask me why, don't really know, but that was just a um, something that I saw, along with nonpolar auxins. So I've seen a lot of people that decided I'm going to try and make callus culture and do indirect organogenesis for my first generation. They make their plant they put it through callus, and they might get a little more, too much callus on there. Um, at that point, they used a nonpolar oxen. If you look at that top right picture, you're going to see the plant is growing upside down. The roots are at the top, and the shoots are at the bottom. That's one of those things that most people are not aware of, and so they don't really think about, well, I need to use polar oxens when I'm trying to root things. Um, the last one that I really have noticed is stage four problems or acclimation problems, where the grower will actually pull their plant out of the test tube and just expect, well, it has shoots and it has roots, why can't I treat it like a cutting? Well, these things have been under 100% humidity. There's no reason that you should expect to treat that like a cutting. You have to harden it off like a cutting, treat it like a non-rooted cutting maybe, but not one that you can just plop out of a tube and stick it straight in a greenhouse. I get um, the question a lot, how long does this take? Generally, the the acclimation stage is that two-week period. Sometimes it can go as high as three, but once you start to kind of see the roots grow, you know the plant's um, a lot more hardened off and generally you can plant it at that point. Germplasm conservation is one of those things that a lot of people have a lot of interest in in this industry, and there's a lot of factors that go along with this. You can put a plant in test tubes, stick it in a refrigerator, and it slows down the degradation of your media, in which case your plant can live a little bit longer. So when you start refrigerating your plants, there are a couple basic rules I've kind of learned from literature and other things that you need to pay attention to. Do not go lower than 40 degrees on your plant tissue. You're essentially starting to freeze it and you'll get a lot more cell death. Um, and I should also mention that your contamination, although slowed down, can still be there in a refrigerator. I've stored um, test tubes for a long period of time in a refrigerated condition, and over, when I pop them out three or four months later, I can have a world of contamination if I didn't keep that refrigerator sterile in some way or another. I didn't keep the room it was in sterile. So it's very good to know you need to do this in a pretty clean, um, I'd recommend ISO 5 standard lab or better. The other one that a lot of people ask is, can you freeze these cultures, cryopreserve them, that sort of stuff. I have actually never personally tried cryopreserving um, cannabis tissue culture, but what I have found in all the literature is there's all sorts of issues with either freezing or thawing that causes the vacuoles to burst, and that causes a lot more problems in the long term for even trying this out. So whenever I'm starting somebody out in a lab or whatnot, I just recommend they go uh, room temperature, no more than refrigerator and just work with that, develop their protocols before they try and do long-term storage or commercial propagation or anything like that, because in the end you're just going to be dumping a ton of money into these labs without actually knowing how to keep the plant alive in them and why waste your money. Plant breeding was another aspect of um, cannabis tissue culture that a lot of people have had interest in. So I'll kind of touch briefly on it, and that's you can germinate plants in vitro, um, so inside the test tube. It takes about eight days for them to get uh, to about the point of the middle picture. And you can screen them for pathogens. So medicinal genomics, I know, has um, a female-male indicator for sex testing. And what I found was if I grew them in a test tube, I could 
pop open the lid, take a little bit of tissue sample, run it through PCR and extract the DNA, and be able to see, is it male or female, um, since it does not detect hermaphrodites, it was a you know, somewhat biased test, but at the same time, male or female for those uh, for the sex of that seedling. That allowed you to separate the seedlings out in your room, and you could then grow all female or produce a much higher quality breeding program. The other one is green pod sowing, where you can actually uh, pollinate a female plant and wait a week until the seed starts to develop. The embryo develops first, and then the seed coat develops around the embryo. When you pull the seed early and the embryo is developed, you can actually put that in culture and grow it out, and you can cut months off your breeding cycles every generation because you're not waiting for a seed coat to develop with all the nutrients, hormones, and vitamins the plant needs in order to grow and keep it alive within the seed coat itself. So. The big one that I'm going to talk about is uh, cost-benefit analysis of tissue culture. And I have a couple different labs that I've set up, and I try and do, you know, all the way from small scale to medium scale. I try to avoid the large-scale propagation currently because I don't know anybody that has a completed protocol that can get any strain you want or any cultivar you want through the entire process from start to finish without a hitch. And when people are asking about times, how long can I get a return on my investment, those sort of deals, when you start to get these numbers and throw them out there, you don't want to give a false impression of what you're actually providing. So what I would recommend is go with the essentially thirty-five dollars to $40,000 lab if you really want to start and figure out what protocols uh, you need to make or how to go about making them. You can always go a little bit cheaper if you need to, but that $40,000 range allows you to get a good hood, a good autoclave, and really um, put your plants through culture efficiently and successfully while having the ability to trial some other medias and some other hormones just to make sure you're not basically shooting yourself in the foot. That being said, if you go more expensive labs, you are still able to do in-house breeding techniques, you're still able to do production and all that. And if you start at the low scale, your equipment does not become senile or obsolete over time. You can still use the old hood and the old autoclave as you're expanding to a bigger lab to get the results that you're really looking for. So with that being said, I have a couple more minutes here, and I'm just curious on if anybody has questions, I'd love to take some. Uh, you mentioned the endopathogens you're seeing in the system that contaminate the tissue culture. Are those plant pathogens uh, that will eventually be reflected in the plant, or are those just a problem in the tissue culture? So those are a um, pathogen that you will see eventually reflected in the plant, and sometimes they are beneficial and sometimes they are toxic. Mm -hmm. So. If they're present, it makes your tissue culture process much more complicated and much harder. Initially, they're in the plant when you took the culture, when you took the explant. So when it was before in vitro, before stage one, you have the plant to grow, and that pathogen is present. By cutting it out and putting it in a tube, you're just showing that it's there rather than eliminating it um, altogether. There are methods of eliminating using antibiotics or other things, but those are all protocols that still have to be developed for cannabis specifically. Okay, one quick follow-up to that. Uh, I'm sure not in your tissue culture operations, but in general in the industry, are there certain pathogens that are appearing in, uh, in product put out by the current nursery practices? Um, I don't. I can't speak for tissue culture being put out per se, but I do know um, there are quite a few present. Uh, Fusarium is one among them. I've actually cultured that out myself and looked for that. Uh, I've also heard confirmation of other growers finding Fusarium in their plants. Uh, different species of Bacillus. Um, I think Phytophthora is a pretty big one as well, and those are all the know all that I know off the top of my head. But I'm sure there's a plethora of them. Thank you. Well, can you comment on the addition of beneficial symbionts at any of the stage, mycorrhizae, um, fungi, that kind of, uh, those kind of uh, uh, 
microbial additions? Yeah, sure. Um, so every time that I have gone to, I, I should mention, I've worked in a bacteria culture lab. And when I did that, we had to make specific media and antibiotics to make it so other bacteria didn't grow in there. When you're making tissue culture media, there's no antibiotics. You're basically creating a cocktail that everything loves to grow in, including fungus and bacteria. So you're perpetuating the problem if you add those inoculants right before you uh, take the culture itself. So is there an optimal stage, like at your rooting stage or whatever, that you can add it before you, you actually go ahead and root in matrix and soil? You cannot. You have to add them in your soil itself um, because under in vitro conditions, that media will grow whatever you're trying to add and take over the plant. So it is not really a tissue culture solution. It's a matrix. It's a post-rooting uh, post in the matrix solution, as you're saying. Right? Yeah, exactly. Hey, fantastic, uh, fantastic talk. Um, how are you determining whether the viruses are, are there or not? Um, is this just a visual detection? And then uh, with respect to the slide that you had, with uh, which I love, the um, you had your, your cost-benefit analysis there. Uh, is the automated step, um, I, I assume that... Uh, liquid handling or sample prep is a big part of, of that protocol. Um, uh, can you speak to any uh, software that you've seen or, or um, systems that are being used in a high throughput way to uh, do some of that method development and protocol work? Um, actually, yes, I have. So. Uh, I found it on a YouTube video, actually, that's uh, pretty readily available if anybody wants to look for it, of a couple very large-scale production labs that have automated media pouring techniques that they do. And so it'll pre-make the media in the autoclave and then pipe it as a, a flat moves along uh, basically um, a line. And that flat fills every single tube and all of a sudden you don't have anybody filling tubes. You have people picking them up, setting them on the rack and pulling them off the rack pre-filled. Um, and then would you repeat your other question please? Yeah, so you mentioned that um, uh, you're, you found disease, um, or, I'm sorry, viruses. When you've identified these viruses, I'm wondering is this visual detection or are you actually doing some kind of um, uh, I get more, what you're saying. More validated. Uh, <laughs> so there's a couple different techniques you can actually use. The first one would be visual identification. But there are strips that you can actually use to tell are there viruses in those plants. And they have a 99.8% accuracy. Um, I've trialed some of those and confirmed there was no virus in the first place. So it could just be you thought that it looked like that. Sometimes, because those strips are so specific, you actually need to take it to a commercial virus testing laboratory and have them run an analysis to see is there a virus in there. And they can only test four things that they're that they think might be in there. Um, a lot of those virus testing laboratories, um, again, I used to work for something like that, uh, are not able to figure out random viruses or things that they don't know what to look for. So I guess the short answer to that is, yes, you can visually try and detect and identify, and sometimes that'll work. But I always recommend getting a third-party lab to really make sure that your culture is, in fact, virus-free. And if you're going to try and do it in-house, at least use a strip test. They cost a couple bucks a piece. Mm. Make sure you don't have a virus in your plant tissue before you go selling it. Well, I, I, there's obviously controversy over whether some viruses are systemic. Yep. and whether you can get rid of them. So, you know, I, I think it, it can be a touchy issue as when you're saying that uh, tissue culture can completely remediate uh, a, a virus because similar to the problem of um, the variability within, you know, these chemovars that you're, uh, you're, you're culturing, you're going to see probably some, some phenotypical uh, differences there as well. Yeah, I, I would completely agree with that, actually. And even when you go to take your meristem culture, at times, if you take too much tissue, you still haven't cultured out of the virus. So it's very important to know, using um, either strip tests or third-party labs, that you did, in fact, culture out of that, and not just relying on your eyes to, you know, tell you. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. Yep.
to welcome everyone to the American Cannabis, sponsored by Cannabis Tech. I'm your host, Ellis Smith, and today we're going to be speaking with Dr. Mitch Day on micropropagation of cannabis. Mitch, how are you doing today? Thanks for coming in. I'm doing well. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite things, so thank you. You bet. And so today we're going to talk about plant tissue culture, um, but also I want to give a little quick background on Mitch. And so his background is in plant tissue culture data visualization, public outreach, conservation genomics, and bioinformatics. If you would, please, give us a little understanding of what some of those things mean. What are those things? Well, just uh, kind of, I guess I'll just do it biographically in the order that my career kind of advanced. Um, I, as an undergraduate, very early on, I got introduced to plant tissue culture as a method um, for laboratory research. Um, I was working with some geneticists that were looking at mutations in flowering genes. And we needed a way to short-circuit the plant reproductive life cycle. Basically, these guys couldn't have sex because they had weird parts. And that's <laughs> what it was about. I mean, uh, how do you get around it? And, you know, I, I uh, led a project to develop a method to short-circuit the plant life cycle, double up the, the genome without using sex so that you could see what those genes actually do. Pure basic research. It's an extremely interesting method, but that was just something I did as an undergrad. I moved on into uh, the GIS field, which is uh, you know, basically Google Maps is, is, the, is really a, a GIS that everyone uses and doesn't even realize it. Uh, my public outreach work was related to GIS, where essentially we were working with large groups of business owners all up and down the Mississippi River. We wanted to do something cooperative to encourage economic development along that corridor, but we didn't know how to do it, so it was a sort of a stakeholder outreach effort where we used digital mapping resources to get ideas generated. And uh, so we would intentionally make maps that were left unfinished and incomplete and take those to public meetings. Um, even though we had more data than we were presenting, the purpose of it was to stimulate discussion and to get people to fill in their own blanks. Uh, it was a very useful experience for that because when you're dealing with technical subjects like we're dealing with today, mm -hmm. You have to understand your audience, and you have to engage them. Otherwise, they give you that look, which a scientist get. I mean, we early in our careers, we're excited with what we know, and uh, <laughs> we have to learn how to how to share that with as many people as possible if we're going to get any attention. Most recently in my career, I've I've been uh, working in a field called conservation genomics, and essentially that's just applying. DNA, sequencing, and analysis to figuring out how to save endangered species, in my case, particularly foxes and trout. Bioinformatics, uh, just to explain that term for those that don't know it, it's really just computer science applied to really, really big data sets. So, you know, you hear about data science all the time. It's a type of data science that involves working with data, uh, data sets that might be terabytes in size. So anyway, that's a nutshell version of where I come from professionally and other uh, things that interest me. Pretty cool. Very interesting background, very diverse. Uh, I believe you also grew up farming as a kid, too, if you want to kind of touch on that. Oh, yeah. I know you, uh, yeah, well, yeah, we're getting my life story. I was born <laughs> in Boulder, and uh, my parents fled Boulder because uh, they're not crunchy. They're not. Uh, <laughs> Uh, most of my extended family is in Idaho, so we actually, growing up, had hydroponic greenhouses growing tomatoes and European cucumbers. Uh, back in the day, the genetics of those European cucumbers were not stable, and so you'd have yard-long cucumbers that you couldn't sell because there's nothing to do with that except play baseball with green tomatoes you couldn't sell. <laughs> so, yeah, Interesting. that's, that's kind of where I come from. Cool. So I love you have a, a long back history. So Yeah. Um, I've known Mitch for over three years now, and he and I have uh, kind of had an indirect working relationship, and I've really watched Mitch, um, you know, get into the cannabis space and develop uh, micropropagation. Uh, and it's cool to have him on here today, as um, I've been um, kicking tires with him for many years and have some things in the works, and uh, just glad to have you here. And so today our objectives are really to inform, start a conversation, and collaborate and learn. And so let's jump in here. What is this? Micropropagation. Explain to us what this is. What are we talking about today? Micropropagation is almost exactly what it sounds like. It's propagating a plant, cloning, as we know in the cannabis industry. I don't think I need to explain that to this audience, why we do it and what it is. Micropropagation is just cloning, except that you use incredibly small pieces of tissue. It's just one of many methods that fall under the umbrella of plant tissue culture, which is a commonly used 
I guess, umbrella term. But micropropagation is just a precise term that describes a very specific method. You can see in the figure that I have up on this slide, you'll see uh, it's a culture container. It's got a, a clear growing medium in it, and you'll see some little bits of green matter that have been encapsulated in that gel. Those are just the growing points of, uh, that came from the plant, and uh, they are ready to regrow. How big is that in relative size? Was it like a dime size? If you're viewing this on about a 13-inch monitor uh, on your laptop, that is just slightly larger than life size. Than scale. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's a very small piece of plant that you've, you know, basically chiseled down. Is basically what you've done, correct? And we'll get into that in a little more detail. Yeah, that's the what. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, let's explain this whole plant life cycle here and really kind of walk us through this process and uh, kind of show us uh, how this really makes sense. Sure. Well, before we can get into the why, you know, we start with the what. And uh, this might be 101 for a lot of folks, but not everyone in attendance uh, may be a plant biologist. So I just want to have a little common vocabulary so we can all know what we're talking about. This is a little diagram I put up that just shows the plant life cycle. You can get plants from seeds or you can get them from clones and uh, you can cut them. I just like this figure because it just shows how all things relate and I like to keep track of information. It's part of my professional training and so when you do that, you diagrams like this, this is called an entity relationship diagram in the database design world. It's how you start when you're trying to figure out how you're going to keep track of a lot of information and that's something that is important with micropropagation. Micropropagation is just propagating plants. Why are you propagating them, though, is the interesting question. And that's why I wanted to start with this, because it's into the why. And I hope by the end of the presentation, that why I think this is a good way to begin. Perfect. Okay, if you want to just continue on with just uh, the plant anatomy here and um, just kind of walk us through with some of these visual aids here that you have for us. Sure, yeah. This may be... Uh, a familiar organism for people here on the right. It's a cannabis plant. It's a little bit stretched out, but I chose this image because it shows the features of the plant anatomy that I want to highlight. There are uh, nodes, which are those areas there where the leaves are emerging from the plant stem, and the axle is just that little angle between the emerging leaf and the stem, and then the internode is just the space between nodes. And uh, the growing tip of any of those branches that you see there is called the meristem. The meristem is where the action is. That's the interesting part of a plant where all the growth and cell division is really happening. You'll see in the other figure, that's a figure that I borrowed from Wikimedia because it's a nice, clear image. It's actually a coleus, a common garden plant, but it has a nice structure that's very typical of all plants. You can see those arrows pointing to two areas where the cell walls, um, that's what those reddish zones are. There's a lot of cells packed in very, very tightly there. And those are called meristems. Those are the, the growing tip, and that little tip will eventually elongate, and those leaves that spin off from the side will eventually grow into full leaves. And if they're off to the, if there's a meristem off to the side, like that one on the right, uh, that may become a branch. And uh, those are the parts that we're interested in because they're cells that know that they need to be growing. That's their mission, and that's what they're set up to do. They're the ones that make new cells. The other cells, they've got their mission and their fate in life is set and they just can expand, but they can't really divide a whole lot. If you want to grow new plants, that's where you have to live. All right, let's understand some of this terminology. We, we hear this term quite a bit, tissue culture, and I think even myself, I've kind of learned that uh, for the type of um, processing that we're doing as far as propagating is really micropropagation on some of the stuff that I've been looking at. And so if you could just bring a little more clarity, because these terms are confusing, <laughs> you know, Absolutely. and really, really break down what the differences in these uh, these four different types of, uh, of propagation are. If you get lost um, in, a, in a web search and start searching these techniques, you'll see this information organized in a lot of different ways because it is, a, again, a complicated topic that involves a lot of different potential methods and applications. But I try to simplify it by just dividing the methods up into, uh, well, according to how finely you chop up the plant material. 
Uh, so stem propagation, that's just another way of describing traditional cloning. I'm going to advance the slide to the next screen because I have a little table that has those same points of information uh, with a little bit of additional information. So I'll use that to guide my discussion. Uh, stem propagation is cloning, and why do you do it? Really, the only reason to do it is to propagate. You want more of what you have, and you have a pair of scissors. You chop off a stem, and you have another plant. Micropropagation, you're just taking it a little bit further. You get a better pair of scissors. You might use a razor blade, um, but you're getting down to the, the tip. And uh, it's a small bit of tissue, but it's still quite visible and something you can handle without using magnification, but you would need tweezers. And it requires a little bit more care at this point, correct? And food does. source and lighting. And at this point, the plant is so damaged and, and cut down that it can't. The stem can't survive on its own. Cloning, even when you're doing uh, stem propagation and you're cloning, you still have to baby the clone to a certain extent. It's not hard. You keep it moist and not swampy, and give it a little bit of light. That's it. But it still requires more care mm -hmm. than a than a seedling might. And it only gets more difficult to take care of these cultures as you move down on this table. In fact, this table is sort of cumulative. On my why do it column, the reason that you stem you know, do stem propagation is for propagation, but that's also the reason you do any of the other methods. That's what I mean by that. So for micropropagation, you also would use that for large-scale propagation if you're in the wholesale nursery business, for instance. Meristem culture is... Essentially, you're getting even finer. You might need a microscope or a dissecting scope, but you're still chopping things up mechanically or physically. This method is very well known in the commercial orchid industry as one of the ways they first figured out how to get viruses out of the orchids. It just involved micro dissection of the of the shoot tip of a valuable orchid and generate quite a lot of plants from that. So if you want to ref if you think back to that uh, figure where I showed the meristem, essentially in orchids, those are the meristems are very, very densely packed. And so if you get a tiny one and chop it up, generate them very easily because that's already what they were programmed to do. Protoplast culture is where things get very, very interesting, and that's where you can't use any mechanical cutting anymore. You have to use chemistry. Solve the cell wall around cells, and you end up with a bunch of naked cells that are then you can plate them out and regrow them. You can do all kinds of things with them. But in the end, after many more steps than in any of the other processes, you generate whole plants again. Okay. Wow. Okay, let's dive in a little bit deeper here and let's really understand and break this down some. You know, why why micropropagate? Well, you know, you kind of have some some examples here on this methods compare, but really let's, let's dive into a little bit more deeper and uh, and really understand this. Yeah, why specifically would you want to use micropropagation? I'm focused on that today because it's the most accessible method. It's something that, honestly, you can use, uh, I'd say, not kitchen technology, but super kitchen technology. It's, it's something that doesn't require a whole lot, um, a whole lot of laboratory stuff, a, good, a really good scale and a, a pressure cooker. You begin micropropagation. The one reason you might want to do it is you have fewer microbial hitchhikers and what that means, well, you see this image there on the, on the slide. That's a petri dish and the little white smear that you see. That's a, an organism that I've isolated from the inside of many cannabis cultivars that I've tried to culture in the past. Now, I know they came from the inside because of the multiple times you sterilize the surface. Uh, put that into a culture and you see something that grows. Uh, you know it didn't come from the surface because you eradicated everything that was living there. Uh, I was able to re-isolate this organism multiple times. We had it sequenced, and it's a, it's a bacillus that's very, very close to the bacillus people add as beneficials to their soils. This is a, a real thing. It's, they're called endophytes, and endophytes are actually beneficial to plants in many cases. We don't know if this is an endophyte in, uh, in cannabis. At least I don't. If someone does, that's a conversation I want to have <laughs> um, because this is something that's curious. It was just a particular interesting one. But if you, if you micropropagate under the right culture conditions, you can get rid of these kinds of hitchhikers, the ones on the surface and ones that are in the cells. The smaller the microbial hitchhiker, the more challenging the eradication that bacteria tend to be. Explain to me how, when you say 
clean, eradicate, how do you physically remove this bacteria or bac any other type from this, or even viruses? How does how do you do this? What is there a a Kleenex or Clorox, Clorox bleach? What are you what are you using? And you know how is it? Well, it's uh, the philosophy behind it is the best way to defeat your enemies is to outlive them or outgrow them. So what you do is you do the sterilization that you can. Plants can survive being dipped in bleach as long as there's no cut surface there and you don't use too much bleach. So you can kill some things on the surface and, and get started. But really the, the final step that you've got to get right in order to eradicate things, you've got to encourage growth conditions that are so good for the plant that it can grow very, very quickly and basically entomb any remaining pathogens that the, uh, that the chemical treatment doesn't, doesn't kill. You've got to basically entomb them in plant tissues. Uh, that's, that's how plants work. They, they segregate and entomb their pathogens in tissue. They don't have an active immune system like people do. They basically just outgrow their, their pathogens. So you just help them along. Wow. Um, and then so as we look at traditional cloning practices, um, we know it requires a lot of mother stock. It's very labor intensive. Um, there's a lot of space um, that um, that is in there that is required to really achieve a high volume. Micropropagation allows us to really streamline our labor force, really condense that space down into a higher volume of, uh, of units. And so um, as we look at this, as our industry is evolving, this is comes down to your bottom line of your business when it hits a certain scale, and this makes more sense from a labor standpoint and even space allocation for how you're going to, just just from those two components alone, but then you also look at the added value of contaminated free genetics and all these things. So um, explain that a little bit more on why just this is so important, and as we scale and our industry is growing, we're going to be shifting and changing, and our, 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 the way we're doing things now are going to be very different the next five or ten years as this technology becomes more readily available and people buy into it. Right, and it's, it is a matter of scale. This, uh, in, implementing micropropagation is a complicated operational decision. That there's a lot of different factors. There's a certain point in your operation, though, when it, when it becomes cost-effective. You have a large enough production goal, or you have genetics that are precious enough or valuable enough take the care to, that's when this becomes a very useful method. And we don't have to invent anything in the cannabis industry. We have a long history of these kinds of methods being used in, in crop improvement and in the horticulture industry for the better part of a century now. Uh, that we're just learning from the past on this. We've got some things you have to do to customize and research specific for this species, but the general principles are well known. One of the first reasons that we can make the claim that it's more labor efficient is honestly just the amount of care and the number of touches that you have to have on your sample. It takes a bit of a bit of care to prep a plant and to harvest the material, but it's all done in a very small, compact space. A single worker with fast hands and uh, quite a large number. And uh, once the cultures are sitting on the shelf and you have a properly designed facility, and you have your, your sanitation and your aseptic methods worked out, you very rarely have to visit the cultures for long periods of time. So they can sit and do their growing. And, uh, you know, there are interesting challenges when it comes to designing these shelving systems. That's it. Um, best in the capital and the labor saving of mind. Good, a few good, efficient. The ROI will come, one, from it's your labor but also, too, just uh, your improvement in your crops and just consistency you know, from starting with clean material. I think uh, added value that I think we're going to see more and more folks dive into. Yeah, yeah, I, I expect this method. I mean, we already know there are people entering into the industry that are interested in, uh, that have been applying this method. There's been a lot of discussion about it on the, on the various online groups where the serious folks meet and talk about this stuff. It's... Uh, it's here, but the trick is, is getting it right and using it for the right reasons in the right place at the right scale. And then uh, can I explain why it's good that these cultures can be slow and grown and kept for long periods with minimal care? 
Uh, I know the answer, but I want you to tell our audience just just, just the value behind this type of methodology with not, uh, with, without really having to have mother stock right. in, in, in that mindset. Well, genetics are valuable. I think that's a, it's a constant topic of discussion in this industry about you know how do we how do we treat our genetics? How do we make them valuable? How do we reward the people who make better genetics? Well, you can't get any value from your genetics if you've lost them. And mother plants are large. They are relatively expensive to keep. You can keep a large number of things on the shelf that you only have to look at occasionally. You have a larger genetic library to draw from. That makes you a better reader. Got more to work with. Well, th this is uh, the meat of, I think, our conversation today, and I think people are going to be excited to really understand this particular part of this uh, of our talk today. Is how do we micropropagate? Where, you know, how does this process start? Where does, you know, and how does it end? And what are the steps in between? And this is something that, um, you know, once I understood it, I was told many different urban myths on, you know, tissue culture and what it really was. And I, once I discovered what I was told and what I learned, it was two different things. And so. Right. Um, I think this is going to be exciting for our audience to really kind of dive into this this component here. So yeah, let's uh, let's go through these slides and really sure. break down. You know, how do you do this? All right. Well, yeah, I've given you a broad overview of all of the potential methods, but we're just going to focus on the one micropropagation, the one that I think is the most accessible to our audience, and one that uh, people could consider beginning using right away. Information you can use, I hope. You got to get started with the mother plant. You have to. Um, you can use pruning techniques to prune the mother plant to produce as many of those fast-growing meristems as you can. Uh, there are some cannabis uh, terms out there. I think the floribunding was. I think Ed Rosenthal was authored that term or he coined that that term for uh, pinching up your plant in a certain way to get a, to get as many things as you could for cloning. Any kind of a method like that that. Uh, just, you know, pinches that plant up so there's lots of good growing tips um, is how you get started. It's the right kind of material. It needs to be thin and non-woody. Non uh, and uh, if it's in an active state of growth when you put it into a culture container and you do it right, it'll remain in an active state. That's, uh, that's the nutshell of it. How you prepare that starting material is you, you harvest it, you cut it, leach it, you rinse it under very, very clean conditions. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, so if there are questions about what I mean about that, that's something I'm going to cover a little bit later, but I think it warrants a, a separate discussion of its own, so I'm going to put a pin in that. All right. Sure. All right. Um, real quick, I'd want to, an I want to answer this question as we're kind of getting to the storage part when you clean, chop, and coddle and getting to the storage here. Absolutely. And maybe a little premature, but I want to get this out of the way as one of our listeners has had this up for a few minutes. His question is, is PTC a better storage method, method in seeds for long-term storage if the cultures are kept in a controlled environment? That's a good question. Um, it's a different kind of storage. Seeds require even less care, cool temperatures, relatively you know, controlled humidity, and uh, you can get germination decades from a large uh, you know, sample of seeds. So they're very different. The reasons that you would keep seeds are different uh, than you would keep cultures. You've got a genotype that you love and you don't know why you love it or you don't know the genetic reason that you love it. You want to keep a clone. You want to keep it in a plant tissue culture state. You might want to propagate that mm. for commercial production. If you're a visionary and you're a plant breeder and you've got a vision about what you want, and you know some male parents that might want to get together with your female plants, You've got seeds that you can keep, and you understand that are an entirely different kind of product. The future is seeds. Micropropagation is a method, but plants take real plants from. Yep. So it comes down to seeds. Ultimately, you use micropropagation as part of a bigger effort to make better seeds. Okay. I think we're not, we don't always have the luxury of seed to with some of these varieties. Sometimes we get clone only varieties and um, that may be your only outlet of storage. And so I think that's something to also play into the conversation. Oh, absolutely true. Some cultivars that I've worked with and, and brought to seed are extremely poor seed producers. They were never selected for that and they're extremely poor seed producers. Uh, that's a, a genetic 
flaw in their in their background. They are a wonderful producer, or it may be the reason that they're a wonderful producer. Find out. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yeah. All right. Explain to us these these uh, these steps and variations in the process, and the you know the sugar and the nutrients required, uh, and really just you know as you get these things cleaned and chopped, and that coddling. You know mm-hmm. what is what is that coddling? Well, there are many variations of this process, so I'll be a little bit general. But there is one universal requirement: plants, any living organism essentially has to have sugar to live. You eat food, but it's ultimately turned into sugar. Plants photosynthesize to make sugars. When you remove all their leaves, remove their ability to do that. So for a while, while they're small and in this encapsulated state that you see in this figure that I've reused here, you've got to feed them some external carbon. Uh, that's in the form of sugar. That's useful. It's a good, efficient food source. It gets them started. They can unfurl their own leaves and begin making their own food. But at some point, the sugar becomes a problem of its own, and I'll talk about that in some future. But the sugar is an opportunity and a challenge. You've got to feed it to them. That is a, a universal requirement for this method, regardless of your variations that you use. Now, how do you coddle them? How do you chop them? The, the method that, I, that I've implemented in this particular figure, you see those growing tips. They look like they're in some sort of a bead of their own, and so they are. They are. This was a two-step process, the gel material that fills most of the culture container is gel van or gel right. It's a seaweed-based growing medium common in microbiology and in plant tissue culture. But the growing tips were encapsulated in a separate process um, in a related material called alginate, which sets up differently. You don't melt it. You use chemistry you get them to set up. You take those freshly cut tips, and before they can dry out and get stressed, you quickly encapsulate them by coating them with alginate dropping them into a solution that treats them very gently but gives the calcium that's needed for that little setup. It's basically a cradle or a womb for the for the growing tip to I was survive. about to use that analogy, like a womb for it, basically. Exactly. And the chemical composition of both of those gels in that picture are kept as similar as possible because they will be eventually anyway by diffusion there. Treat them gently, and if you do it right, you will see growth cracking out of those beads Sometimes, honestly, within 48 hours or less. Oh, wow. If you're doing it right and you have your conditions right, including the quality of your starting material, That's great. your growing conditions, and uh, and that does vary cultivar by cultivar, too. Some cultivars of being chopped up. Do you create these recipes for these embryos, I'll call them, or these little um, nutrient sacks, I guess, or do you purchase them um, that, that that's already pre-made for this? Well, it's a little bit of both. I mean, there are some very common methods, some very common nutrient solutions that are really just part of the public domain. Uh, they've been known for years. They were proven. Uh, there's a, a salt mixture that was developed in tobacco because that was used as a research plant for, for very, very many years. And so this was developed in academic settings. And so it's a matter of public knowledge. But then there's all the other additives, sugar, the antimicrobials that you have to add. Sometimes some methods use plant growth regulators, um, those sorts of things. That's where the mixing comes from. Generally, the standard salt mixtures, there are so many different varieties of them. That have been. There's not much invention there, although a large-scale operation, there, there is tweaking because certain minor constituents might want to tweak those to optimize the process. But that's something that happens as you you go along and as you scale. The generic formulas, those are well-known and can be found by anyone with some Google skills. (laughs) Okay, now, at this point in the process, this is where you could store long-term genetics and slow the growth down. As as we go back to a few slides, we're talking about slowing it down. Is this at the stage you would do this at for long-term storage? One, because it's such small plantlets, and so you can put a lot in this space. And this is just one of the methods for storing genetic material long term. I'm just focusing on the micropropagation method again because it's the most accessible. I'm trying to get this kind of information out to a big audience. The method that you can use is the one you could use. Okay. The, all you really need to do to slow them down at this state is just lower the temperature and dim the lights. 
they uh, they just slow down. They still keep growing. Still have to look at them once in a while, but they uh, they just hum along and operate at a lower tem a temperature. Chemical reactions in general just go slower at lower temperatures, and so growth just has to go slower because of physics. Well, this leads into a great question from someone who's saying, how long can cannabis stock be stored in tissue culture without degradation? I think this kind of leads into this. Well, that's a, that's a question that comes up a lot, and I'm assuming that the questioner, uh, please chime in uh, if, if I'm misinterpreting your question, but that you mean uh, genetic degradation. Uh, I'm assuming that's the background, because that's usually sure. the... Or even with the... I mean, the, uh, I guess that can be looked at in two ways. Yes, one, genetic de degradation, but two, does could the plant actually degrade, like full-on decompose, and okay. actually decompose, I guess, is the word I would probably use. Well, absolutely, yes. There, if, if you're storing plants this way, you are still going to have to occasionally do a, a process that I call subculturing, the common method where essentially you would just take the same material, chop it up, and coddle it again. So indefinitely is the answer. Now, when it comes to genetic degradation, that's a different story. Mutation in plants stored this way is extremely rare. Not really disrupting the plant at a cellular level. You're not doing anything to cause mutation. Great. Now, but there, there is a question mark there, though, because of the relative infancy of cannabis genetic research. There may be instances of it. But if you look at the, the literature or all other crop and horticultural and research species that have been subjected to that kind of testing, uh, chromosomal or genetic mutations using this particular method are very, very, very rarely. Hmm. Okay. Well, now that we've got these um, small the plantlets going and we are finally getting some growth and you start to see uh, some leaves, What's the next step here? You know, you got the slide as deflask and harden, and I think some of us may know that term hardening from either our seed starting or even our cloning. And so, um, how does oh that yeah. Work? yeah, anyone that grows in a greenhouse knows the the term hardening because you you know just like us treat us too nicely, we get a little soft <laughs> and uh, can't handle uh, can't handle the the real world. <laughs> I love that analogy. It's even uh, it's even more. Uh, apt here because you see that little culture container. That thing is completely protected from the outside environment. There's even a little filter on the top of that culture container that keeps anything from getting in that's bacterial. The only thing you can get in and out is air and a little bit of water vapor. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a living in a bubble. And there's all that sugar on it. If you bring that out into the real world, leave all that sugar on it. That's just a feast for any pathogen microbe that lands on it that's in the air. So again, clean conditions and uh, gentle introduction to the real world. Now, getting that sugar off is a major process challenge that's a very significant one and probably one that will determine uh, your success or failure at doing this cost-effective and efficient way. And, uh, you know, generally it involves just manual work. Really? Yeah. Just that easy? Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, it's just something you have to do. You just have to do it careful and make sure you've got good processes and all checks to your processes, some good quality control. Um, well, it sounds like it's at this stage in the plant now, you're following the same protocol, basically, of a clone coming out of a clone dome and Absolutely. trying to monitor in that same perspective. Those little um, plants that you see in the lower figure those have just come out of the flask. They've been in a dome for perhaps two or three days, and they're tough enough now they can handle 70% humidity. But they are only about two inches tall. So that's only one difference. Your transplanting process might be a little differently because you're working with material that's a bit smaller. A little bit shorter. Yeah, so you've got to take better care of it, different care of it if you're going, once you're getting it to soil. But, yeah, once you're to this point, you've got root growth dealing with the plant. At this point now, it you would never know this was done from micropropagation at this point if no one ever showed you what happened in the back end just presented this to you. You would just think, oh, well, that's a small clone. Yeah. It's, got, it's got a lot of foliage, looks great, healthy. Uh, it has a little funky little um, clear little, <laughs> little um, 
food source, I guess. Is that what that is? Yeah, that's, uh, that's honestly just um, there's a there's a balance you have to strike. When you when you yank these things out of the auger, you can damage their roots. But they work so hard to grow. But you can get the timing right. They don't have a whole lot of roots, but they're just ready to blow up cool. on root growth. So this was a, a, a variation on a method that we tried quite a while ago that uh, just used that same gel material to hold them in place. It was very successful in, in the pilot that we tried. We've moved on to other methods. But it was a very useful method. Okay. Um, source meristems from cultures. Explain this more to me um, in, 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 in what this means. Um, I personally, I want to just understand a little more in detail. Sure, absolutely. Well, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking bad about, about mother plants. <laughs> uh, and that's because they're expensive. I mean, we all treat our mothers well. And, uh, but that costs money. And uh, ultimately, if you want to do this process on a continuous basis, you can start sourcing your meristems from within those culture containers. I showed this particular picture because it's uh, actually five different plants jammed in there, just like in the earlier slides I showed, but these are more advanced in growth. They've had a chance to even branch. There are probably 20 meristems in that container. And if you grew it a little bit more, you'd have even more. Pop that open, get out your tiny scissors, and uh, produce them you would off of a two-gallon mother. Now, isn't that interesting? Now, that's that just gives you some perspective, and that's why I want to ask you this because I I had never had you I've never heard you explain this to me before. I haven't heard anybody explain this to me before, and this is just so interesting to see how we can now really maximize once again. In a large commercial setting, when you've got two, three, four thousand square foot allocated to your vegetative space and your mother's space, and call it another five hundred to a thousand square foot for your cloning, imagine how you can turn a lot of that square footage into more revenue producing square footage for you and really um, just using your space more wisely. Mm -hmm. And so, um, once again, when you hit that certain scale, it makes sense to really look at bringing this in because it impacts your bottom line and can really change the way you design and build your facilities from from the from day one. And I think that is what's exciting about this is uh, it's really a game changer at a certain scale in my eyes. Right. It's it's more of an operational challenge to drop it in from a from a facility standpoint. It can be this this technique can be dropped into existing facilities. That's relatively easy, but we all know how changing operational processes is. That's where the real challenge is, is integrating this into your, into your workflow. Well, this, I mean, I'm still fascinated by this because you're showing me a visual of three inches tall by three inches wide. You know, that's nine inches, nine, nine, square, square, inches, nine yeah. square inches. You're able to pull out 20 meristems, and anybody knows that's a top on a plant. So you can imagine, in order to grow a plant that has nine tops for you to harvest clones off of, think about that. Mm -hmm. It just puts perspective for me, and I, I'm still just uh, I'm in awe. You can get a lot that. more meristems than sure. that. If, if you're harvesting something like this in a production scale, that that thing is looks like a tangled uh, it's a, box of salad. It's just awesome. A jungle. Awesome. Yeah. So you can definitely get probably a hundred in that space. Yep. If you get once you get your conditions optimized. So this is this is a true benefit on the technology, and I think for me this was just eye opening to really see just that ability in nine square inches, what you can really pull out from a production standpoint. Right. And I think this should just really hit home to our audience of uh, just how neat this is. And really, as we look at scaling, this is um, you know really where our industry is going to go. It already is. So um, how do you build one of these things? What does it require? What goes into this? Uh, does it require um, you know serious protocols and clean protocols with uh, decontamination chambers to go in and out of? Or can you get away with just alcohol and rubber gloves and a hairnet and maybe a little vent fan to help pull you know, um, air out? Or how sophisticated does it have to be? And I'm sure you can tell me the sky's the limit. Or as you show me the picture here, you can show me how simplified this little small workspace is that you were very productive in. And so... Absolutely, yeah. Um, it's it's somewhere in between. If anyone's a Michael Crichton fan, remember the Andromeda strain and the de disinfection procedure they had to go through? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, that's an old movie nerd reference, but it's not necessary to go that, that extreme. It's not necessary to use um, even, honestly, I would say laboratory. You just have to have a very clean environment that's segregated, segregated from your main production facility. 
Uh, the images that you're seeing on this slide, actually I want to shout out uh, the people that hosted me there. This is in one of Green Dream uh, Health Services uh, growing facilities. They hosted us there, and I uh, want to thank them for that, and uh, Shift Cannabis, their, uh, their business partners, they were gracious enough to give us 100 square feet, and uh, we made very good use of it. Always be grateful for their, their uh, mentorship and hosting us. You see some uh, pictures there of the, the ceiling, that, that middle facility there. That's just a HEPA filter that's on the end of a duct, and it recirculates most of the air in the room and then draws in it was about 10% was, uh, was the amount of air that was drawn in from the outside, and then the rest of the fan's blower capacity was just recirculating air in the room already through that filter, through that HEPA filter. And you'll notice on the, uh, the panorama there, that's a little bit skewed. So if, if you're having trouble orienting, I'm basically in a 10 by 10 room standing in the corner. <laughs> and I took a, a panorama to, to, so it looks really spacious. To enhance it. Yeah, there was no twirling or dancing going on in here, though. It was actually a very compact space. So you can just see, I mean, 100 square feet, 10 by 10. Mm -hmm. um, the only exception to that footprint is that little sterilizer that I've got in the upper image. That had to be in a different room purely for facility requirements. But that's a, basically just a, a fancy pressure cooker that uh, is very efficient and safe and faster than a pressure cooker and more consistent for sterilizing the medium and getting everything clean. You can do it that way because you seal your stuff in a jar, walk down the hall, drop it in the sterilizer, bring it back while it's still sealed. Boom. Now, going back to the filtering, uh, actually, I wanted to point that out because I didn't want to get detracted from that because it's, it's an important consideration. To see, the door is open at the moment. When this room is in full operation, that door is closed and there's just a vent at the bottom of the door you've created what's called a positive pressure work zone. And what that means is that fan on the HEPA filter unit is pulling in some air from outside, and it's got nowhere else to go except for out through that grate in the door. So there's a positive flow of air outside of the room. It's all clean that's coming out, so it basically sweeps microbes and contaminants. And right down that hallway, there are several active grow rooms, flower and veg, and we did not have problems with the contamination. The process we did. Awesome. And so, see the workspace, you see what it takes to get the, the environmental controls where it's needed. Now, the operational requirements, you know, how do we uh, how do we manage this? How do we keep everything in order? How do we not mix up all of these tiny little boxes with all these different little plantlets that you, they all look identical? How do you manage that? Well, when I often tell people that this process isn't magic, but actually this is where the magic is. You have to have a good laboratory manager. You have to have a good process. Basically, any um, you know operational competence that you have to, have to maintain a, a large-scale facility, you've got to apply it here. You have to have uh, record-keeping and labeling practices. You've got to have inspection schedules. Time to sit and baby five or six individual cultures. You've got to deal with ideally thousands if you're doing it right. How do you keep track of them? Uh, that's a uh, that's a big challenge and part of the conversation that I want to start with people. There's some real opportunities there, figuring out creative ways to label these, to keep track of them. There's all kinds of companies that are entering into Canada's space that have all kinds of interesting technologies for tracking things. These are, uh, these are definitely, this is definitely an area where those are the most critical, most important. A switched tag in this context, if you're using this for breeding decisions, label mistakes can have you don't see. That is true, <laughs> isn't that? So interesting. Huh. Um, I have a few questions here of, of some folks that have hit in there. Kind of yeah, go back a on a time. few questions. Let's see if we can hit on some of these here um, before we kind of wrap this thing up on uh, on the last slide that I know we want to kind of touch on and give us some time to explain on. Um, is there any more of a concern about genetic mutations with protoplast culture? In general, yes. Because it's now broken down and so vulnerable, I guess I'll use that term. Is that why? Yeah, that's the general explanation for the mechanism for why it might happen. I'm just really referring to the literature that has looked at this question across all kinds of different A little bit more of a problem. However, I want to emphasize that in general, auto major concern. Um, plants have been on this planet quite a long time, longer than us. 
and they know how to protect their genetic information. They, it's, it, they are. They have to take care of it. So yes, mutation <clears throat> is something you have to look for, um, but scale of things, it's a lower level concern that I think um, really it's about doing this and phenotyping your plants, understanding what they do. You'll notice There are genetic tests and things. Genetic integrity. That was a major part of my conservation genomics research that I talked about earlier. We were looking for, uh, actually, we were looking for levels of genetic diversity in whole populations, uh, but genetic diversity. Um, this this person is asking. And with cloning, we know that we always are going to get the same plants. With micro with micro micro propagation, excuse me, it's the same. Or can we have a problem with the genetics? And as I want to explain to them, and you can explain in detail more, micro propagation is just basically traditional cloning taken down to a little smaller part of the plant. Oh, exactly. Right? So it's, yeah. it's, it's no different than a regular cloning process. So nothing changes, right? Not not when you're doing this. This method. I mean, this is something. Uh, this is something that we need to look at in this species. Um, we, but we have so much information drawn from other crop species that that uh, this shouldn't be something that keeps. You. It's a minor part of your operation. It's something to count of, but it shouldn't be a reason that you don't. Okay. Um, here's another question. Can you use UV sterilization over an autoclave? UV sterilization works in many contexts. However, it uh, depends on the chemistry of what you're sterilizing. UV is a good sterilizing agent because it attacks molecules and breaks chemical bonds. So if you've got something in your medium that is sensitive to UV and has a particular bond structure, it may be disrupted or chemically altered by the UV. However, the same is true of heat. You know, if, if you know, you, you heat your stuff, and you may get byproducts. So you just have to optimize your process. So the answer is, in general, you might be able to do it, but it may cause problems with some of your constituents in your. Sure. But the same can be said of heat. But those <clears throat> techniques are well known and solved through proper formulation. Probably you would have to do the same. What are the top three errors new operations make starting micropropagation? Underestimating the amount of time it takes to bulk up your stock. That's the, the primary error. It, it takes quite a while. Your processes have to be ironed out. You've got to have a good, stable operation, and you've got to be prepared to let the people work, bulk up their stock, and uh, um, it doesn't take forever. But I think uh, it's not. Uh, so make sure you understand the amount that it'll take. It also changes your production schedule because the time from cut soil in micropropagation is much longer. So build up a, a large mass of cultures in that time. But you've got to build that backlog to allow your others to bulk. Actually, that's the first and second one. <laughs> it's it's that important and it's that easy to get wrong. It's just a production challenge, though. You have to project management. I mean, you need to have that process on a perpetual cycle, just like you do um, your vegetative and your flowering stock. And so, it's, it's just no different. And uh, just understanding that timeline. Um, here's a question that came in, and see if we can try to answer this: How to reduce cost? to scale micropropagation? Count your steps and stop taking as many. <laughs> <laughs> good process control, you know, good, uh, good Kaizen. Use your lean manufacturing practices. Study your processes. Continuously refine them. Labor is your big cost. Material costs are relatively fixed. There's some opportunity for economizing on your material costs, but your labor costs present. Like the Kaizen reference, I was about to make that. I mean, constant improvement, 
always looking at process flow and making improvements and, and never being satisfied. And right. so I think that's, that's, that's a big component. Um, and that means, you know, that, that key hires are important, uh, record-keeping processes are important. They're all part of a whole ecosystem that has to fire on a Here's something we didn't we didn't answer or we didn't touch on. I think this is this is a great question. How long, on average, does it take from putting an explant into culture to establishing it into veg? And I think this is that's always that big question. And so, what, what, what's our answer here for our audience? It's highly variable based on cultivar. Um, I did mention that earlier. I think that they really liked being treated poorly in this way, <laughs> and uh, they grow. And then others that are otherwise very robust growers in production. Um, we're very reluctant to grow under these conditions. A range, eight to fourteen weeks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. To the point where you're ready to. Okay. Good. You can probably do it faster. Um, there's a lot of optimizations that can happen there, but that's what we've been able. To do. And the, as I mentioned before, as you see, I mean that's that's quite a long time. It's you know three weeks or three months plus. Um, but in the big scheme of things, once you get on a perpetual cycle, you don't have to wait three months every time. You'll get it to where you'll understand you need how many units a month, and you'll get in that cycle. And sure, getting up to that cycle will take time. This is where another, another question comes in. How long does it take to get to a commercial level of production? And so as I was trying to explain, and I'll let Mitch explain more, you've got to get it to scale. It's going to take time, especially perpetually. Yeah, really the answer to the question is uh, just understand the uh, the frustrating and slow part of an exponential growth curve. The, any exponential growth curve, you start with a small amount of material, you start dividing things, and you plot that on a chart. There's an area there where things are relatively flat. Keep it going, and you don't disrupt that continuous round of doubling after doubling. It, it ramps up very, very quickly. So um, really do allow months. But months, yeah. not years. <laughs> yeah, and I, and, I, and I can tell you for some of the projects that we have been um, specking this uh, this in, into the the business model, um, it, it starts out with traditional cloning. You, you've got to do that to get going, and we were we are looking to scale into this, and it's over a nine month to a year time to really replace our traditional propagation from cloning into this methodology. And so, just think about that as. Our audience is looking to possibly do this. That it will take some time, um, but when you finally make that switch, you'll really see the impact. I want to end, if we may, at least on the discussion. I definitely want to have as many questions from the audience as you have, so I'm not wrapping up here. But I do want to kind of throw something new, sort of end on a different note. Let's do this. Yeah, let's talk about the bigger vision. I mean, why are you doing this? This is one tool in your toolkit. And in reference to an earlier questioner that was asking about the three big mistakes, the third one that I don't think I mentioned is overestimating any method. Every method has a utility. Every method has a place. Um, micropropagation is just one method. That applications. Why are you going to do it? You've got a toolkit. What are you building? We're building better genetics. We're building better plants. That's the goal, and that's the future of this industry. I put a little graph on this last slide, a little bit of explanation. The, the y-axis there is bushels per acre of corn yield, and the x-axis is the year 1866 to 2017. Those are corn yields in the U.S. Look at what happened around 1940. You have to uh, look at it very long to see the trend. <laughs> what changed? People finally caught on to the idea of using double-cross hybrids in corn. Lo and behold, yields have continued to increase for on a century now. Um, that's a long time, and that's a lot of improvement. A lot of other things have improved at the same time over the 20th century in corn, but if you break it down, and many people have, there's a lot of good research on this, about half or more of those yield increases that you see on that chart are due solely to improve everything else that people have tried. Fertilization, soil treatments, sides, spraying, whatever you do. That's the other half. So if you want the low hanging fruit terms, you've got to be improving your genetics. I wanted to introduce that as a point of discussion. 
aspects of this method and others that are entering the now really how do you keep your and micropropagation is appealing to scientists stuff around. Get a lot of data off of this stuff while you're making some money and running a Well, I, I just love this slide. Every time I look at it, it just makes me giggle, you know, and you made a really good reference about how when the trend happened, you know, probably half of the increase of yield was due to genetics and the rest being all the other components from nutrients to all the other, other aspects. And I feel like that is where our industry is currently now. I feel like we've got a lot of great operators who – have cracked the, what I call, you know, you can grow the three a light. I'll use that metric, you know, and now people are growing four a light. And I'm knowing guys that are now pushing the five and six pound a light in call it 20 square feet or 25 square feet with 1,000 watt lights. They're doing it with nutrients and pruning and training techniques, but they haven't tapped into the genetic aspect here in the breeding side. And I think if we're already seeing leaps and bounds now in our industry with these types of yields over the last three or four years, imagine what we're going to see here in the future with the proper breeding um, to really go after yield, but also cannabinoids and terpenes and targeting specific elements and, and you know, there's disease resistance. Disease resi ease of harvest. Uh, yeah, yeah, all, all, of, the all of these things, yeah. you know, leaf to calyx ratio, these types of things so that we don't have to trim it. You can just harvest it and it's ready to go and just try it. And so if this I, is exciting. If I can point something out in this chart that I think is a useful historical lesson for the industry, too, the idea of creating hybrid corn is much older than 1940. It was honestly a method that uh, was starting to come out of the, the research universities in the teens. But it took that long for enough people to try it and enough data wow. to, to encourage mass adoption of the like double cross hybrids. So there's that lag time. I don't think we can count on 20 years in this industry for lag time. I hope not. But the lesson is there. Breeding is a long-term investment, but it's where the long-term gains are as well. I think this is where it goes into, you know, uh, creating something, I don't hate to use the word co-op, but really as, a, as our industry as a whole, making this a commu community outreach type program where we've got to get all of the operators involved in this to really participate in the breeding and the in the in the trialing, I guess, is what I really want to use because a lot of the varieties that are being bred right now aren't stable. Uh, they would never pass a seed certification standard ever in traditional horticulture, and I think this is where we're going to see our industry just grow by leaps and bounds as we start to make these moves. Absolutely, this is where it has to go, and this is where it is. There are two different ways to do this. You can do it close to the soil, or you can do it big and Big and bad. There are models for both, and when I say big and bad, I don't mean bad in that sense. I mean really the sense that you can be secretive, but that's expensive because you've got to do everything yourself. If you're a smaller operator. There are ways to become profitable in this industry and to participate in plant breeding, but you've got to focus on a more cooperative model. The secret to me in this industry is finding the right kind of deal structure where you can feel protected that your investment, your work, creating better genetics, protected somehow. There are plenty of new entrants into trying to address aspects of that problem and definitely welcome them. They're all part of the ecosystem. all have to build. There are room for smaller players, but they've got to be smart. And uh, they've got to figure out how, to, how to play with this game. I don't think there's any about the general future of the industry it comes to being the smaller players that can play long term from a production and breeding standpoint, those guys, they're they're gonna be the ones that are genetically sophisticated. That's it. <laughs> so good sustainable business model. Mm -hmm. Um that's uh anything else you want to add on that? I know that's a very key key part we wanted to really uh, you know throw in here at the end. Uh no, except I invite people to reach out to us because I'm really serious about this being a conversation. The secretiveness, you've got to protect your secret sauce, but there's a lot of sauce that isn't secret. Let's talk about that. I like it. All right, before we wrap this up, then i got a few more uh, questions, and I think we're coming on the top of the hour here, and we'll just wrap this up. So 
Um, do you see a business opportunity to replace traditional clones and ship cultures only? And I can say yes. I can say that uh, Minch and I are looking into going in down this pathway together to start businesses in different markets offering the service. And it goes big and beyond that, but I'll just kind of leave it at that. But yes, we definitely would agree with that. Wouldn't you say, Mitch, that this is definitely an opportunity to replace traditional clones? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And for transport, it's not a technical problem. It's regulatory. So, yeah, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. Uh, just uh, fill your forms out correctly. Um, and this is maybe you can help me on this one as well. As I know, I know the cost. Uh, let's see what this says here. Do you have a rough idea of the production cost per clone that can be achieved with micropropagation? I can tell you to cut a clone. If you look at your cost from a labor standpoint and all of the inputs from your medium, um, the, the 14 days of power, all that, you're in about two dollars and thirty cents, give or take, call it thirty or forty cents, and so. Uh, to, to scale that same unit, what, what will that cost be down to? It's going to be multiples less once you have your processes optimized. It's definitely competitive very quickly at cost. And from your experience in the cut flower industry, Ellis, you know that $2.30. 100%. 100%. <laughs> 100%. So, yeah. so, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, yes. Uh, it's definitely not more cost effective. I'm, I'm assuming below 50 cents a unit, probably way less than that, just with with the volume and scale. And so, um, and honestly, that's the differentiator: is the people who have their operations lean enough to the point where they roll that. They'll be that'll be a very good long term advantage. Well, I want to wrap this up. Just know um, this will be available online, and you will be able to access this uh, usually within a few days. And so we just want to thanks our, thank our audience for tuning in today. I want to thank Dr. Mitch Day for coming in today and talking about micropropagation. So thank you. Thank you. It's been, it's been fun. I hope that it was entertaining, and I hope that there weren't any glassy eyes. <laughs> so. Well, this is a, a great topic that I have a lot of passion about yeah. and interest in myself. Well, uh, my eyes are lighting up. This is what I like to do. So hopefully, uh, hopefully I've reached my audience out here. So thank wow. everybody for attending. I had fun today. It was yeah. great. I want to thank everybody for tuning in once again. I'm Ella Smith. Thanks for tuning into the American Cannabis, and thanks our sponsor, Cannabis Tech. Everyone have a great day, and see you next month. about you even though even if I'm not talking to you you know like I oh I'm hyped thing. for hope I hope she's doing good and like those things for our friends and then when we see each other like we get, we're like oh man I was thinking about you but I didn't tell you but like that I was all, yeah yeah and then when we get together it's like we were never apart